Well, hello and welcome to Sunday Morning at the Marxist Library. My name is Eugene Rule, and I will be your host for today's program on the London Revolution, 1640 to 1643, with our speaker, Michael Sturza. And while you're getting settled and while we wait for a few more latecomers, let me give you some background on our library and our institute. The Bibel Fox and Marxist Library was named in memory of two remarkable individuals, Carl Niebel, a economics professor and a refugee from Nazi Germany, and Roscoe Proctor, a farm worker and communist labor organizer. Their book collections form the core of what became the Niebel Proctor Marxist Library for Social Research and uh, first uh, located the Finnish Hall in Berkeley in 1996. The library moved to our current home at uh, 6501 Telegraph Avenue in, Berkeley, in Oakland, about a mile south of the UC Berkeley campus. Uh, in 2004, <clears throat> the Institute for the Critical Study of Society, or ICSS, was formed to further the library's goals of preserving our written heritage and supporting emerging struggles for racial and gender equality and for socialism. The members of ICC, ICSS are active in different aspects of people's struggles in the Bay Area and globally. Some are affiliated with specific uh, political parties and tendencies, others are not. We respect one another, but we do not necessarily agree on all issues, but we do value our tradition of comradely discussion, and we do not permit personal attacks on other individuals in the group. Accordingly, the opinions expressed in our lectures, workshops, and publications are those of the authors only and do not represent a group consensus on the issues discussed. We are united, however, in our respect for the work of Karl Marx and our belief that his work will remain as important for the class struggles of the future as they have been for the past. I can't hear you. We've lost you. Uh, no, you. my mistake. My mistake. I'm correcting that. Uh, that's my mistake. Apologies. Okay. Am I back on? Yes. yes. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I, I won't be much longer. Not to worry. You don't need the hook. Um, as a group, we continue to draw inspiration from the work of Karl Marx, including his 11th thesis on Feuerbach. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And these words, I think, well express the work of today's speaker, Michael Sturza. Our speaker uh, is a lifelong socialist political activist, <clears throat> a native of New York who grew up in Brooklyn. He learned about radical politics from his father, who had been active in the labor movement in, of the 1930s. In 1966, at the age of 14, he attended his first mass anti-Vietnam War rally with other students from his high school. In college, while actively involved in working class struggles, he studied Marxism and in 1974 graduated cum laude from the State University of New York at Buffalo. In the following decades, while continuing to study Marxism and the history of labor and liberation movements, he remained a labor activist with the Communication Workers of America, CWA, and the uh, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, or AFSCME. Uh, Sturza continues to live study and write in New York City. Since his retirement in 2014, he has traveled a good deal, including a nine-week trip to London, York, and Edinburgh, and Dublin. Among the visit places he enjoyed visiting 
were the Cromwell Museum in Huntington and the National Civil War Center in Newark. The trip reinforced his belief in the social nature of the English <clears throat> Revolution. It was a revisionist, uh, it was a revisionist historian's attempt to excise the class basis of the English Revolution and the Civil War that led, and this is what led him to the studies detailed in his work. Uh, Michael's presentation today on the London Revolution of 1640 to 1643 will respond to those revisionist historians who would rewrite the uh, con who would write the concept of revolution out of history. He will provide a defense and restatement of the Marxist view of the English Revolution Civil War by chronicling England's history through the revolution of 1641-1642, which uh, toppled the feudal system and the aftermath. He will explore how London's growing capitalist economy fundamentally conflicted with its decaying feudal society, causing tensions and dislocations that posits the fundamental driving force of the revolution was the militant Puritan movement supported by the class of petty bourgeois artisan craft workers instead of the uh, moderate gentry in the House of Commons. And so with that, we'll turn it over to Michael Sturza, who will speak for about 50 minutes, after which we will have some announcements and discussions. So over to you, Michael. Michael, before you start, let me mute everybody. And then I'll unmute. You can unmute yourself, and Gene, you can unmute yourself. Both of you are co host. So I'm going to mute everybody. So unmute yourself, Michael, and then start. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, well, that was quite an introduction. Um, hello, thank you all for coming. Much like the US Civil War here, the English Civil War remains a divisive line in England and also Ireland up to the present time. The revolution in London in 1641 to 42 and the Civil War which followed were most basically caused by the contradiction between the growing capitalist economy and the rigid hierarchy of the feudal social and political system. This illustrates Karl Marx's dynamic principle that in the course of history, the forces of production, what we today call technology, outstrip relations of production, the formal or informal social hierarchy, causing social distortions and political confrontations. The most famous scene in the English story is that of the king invading the House of Commons with his armed men in January 1642 to arrest five members of parliament for treason. This brought the political struggle against monarchical absolutism to a head. It ended a week later when the king fled London. But more importantly, the struggle took place outside of parliament as well as inside. Without the intervention of tens of thousands of armed people in the streets in defense of parliament, the House of Commons was unable to bring about change, social change on its own. Who were these people? Where did they come from? And why did they care? They were called the middling people. They were a large urban petty bourgeois stratum composed of artisan craft workers, small shopkeepers, early manufacturers, domestic traders, and mariners. In the 16th and early 17th centuries, a master craftsman typically had a modest workshop adjacent to his home with one or two apprentices who lived in his house and or journey, hired journeymen who worked for wages. They sold their output either to customers directly or to shop owners. Their business practices were governed by the city's guilds called livery companies of which they were members. Not a few of them made very good livings and some of the most successful were also money lenders. But the bulk of small producers depended on selling their wares weekly in order to live. Textiles were England's largest export for over two centuries. 
the wool export trade began around 1400. Gradually, the wool was first spun into yarn and woven into cloth and later clothing in England itself before being sent to the Low Countries for finishing and sale. London was therefore a satellite of Antwerp, and from the time of Henry VIII, customs duties on cloth exports accounted for half of government revenue. Considerable economic growth occurred during Elizabeth's long reign, and by 1600, England was an economically capitalist country, despite the large majority of the population still engaged in agriculture. Most of the weaving was done by small livestock farmers or their wives on a loom in their home and sold weekly to a domestic trader. This putting out system predominated during the 16th century and into the 17th. But by then, certain areas of the country had become centers for early manufacturing. A master weaver might have six to 10 looms in a centralized workshop and up to a dozen hired workers. This was still an embryonic stage of industry. Although the workers received wages, there was no division of labor to speak of. This early centralization of work indicated the dismal future that awaited the majority of master craftsmen. As capitalism grew and productivity developed, they were unable to remain independent producers and were pushed into becoming mere wage workers themselves. But in 1640, this trend had only just begun. The middling livery men were respectable employers and like the rest of their class, also mainly Puritan. It was they and their sons, apprentices and employees who provided the horsepower of the revolution, not the politically moderate, more conservative gentry landowners. The London citizens were also often followed by lower class, unskilled wage workers, such as laborers and porters. I wrote this book to refute the right wing revisionist historians who displaced this, the Marxist class analysis in British academia during the 1980s. This was the period of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher and deindustrialization when the ruling capitalists in both the US and Britain brought about a sharp political wrench to conservatism. To achieve my aim required explaining what made the English events a revolution. The answer came from the actions of the London populace in the streets, led by Puritan clergy and merchants in support of a political program incompatible with feudal social relations. Revisionist historians promoted an interpretation of a tranquil and consensual society with nary a sign of poverty or discontent, much less, much less revolution, to be found in the land. As one historian put it, they depicted, quote, a political nation that until 1640 was almost universally deferential and harmonious, and then suddenly exploded in rebellion. We might perhaps call this the Big Bang theory of the Civil War. In the view of these reactionaries, Marxism was not simply wrong about this or that. It could not be right, period. In their virulent anti-communism, they strictly limited what evidence was considered legitimate. Concentrated on the doings of the king and his court, or as one of them put it, the people who count. And fostered the most far-fetched and distorted arguments. It was claimed, for example, that what occurred in the 1640s could not be called a revolution, because at that time the word was only applied to astronomy, not politics. It was not enough to question Marxist interpretation. They had to malign its entire method and ideology, even if it took a denial of reality to do so. At bottom, the argument turned on the question, how do we understand history? For the revisionists, History is composed of events that happen to happen. They occur accidentally, by chance, or as unintended consequences. At most, they are the result of decisions made at the highest levels of society. Their rejection on principle of history as an ongoing process with a trajectory meant they were unable to explain how or why societies change over time. For them, history is simultaneously static and anarchic. In stark contrast to this, Marx and Engels' view was historical materialism, also known as dialectical materialism. Revisionists attacked it as imposing theory on facts. In reality, it is the other way around. The course of the actual events show the development of a discernible historical pattern, 
And this is the approach I followed in my book. Human societies, no less than nature, have an evolution. To understand a given society, one must therefore start with the technical level of production, the type and amount of goods that are produced and circulated. But within the economic system of production is always the social question of labor. Who labors or doesn't to produce the economic output, under what conditions and for whose benefit, must be the prerequisite questions for any historian. This is the social class analysis that Marxism provides us as a fundamental guide to evaluation. Classes are defined by their role in the economic process. It is the mutually exclusive material interests of opposing classes for the wealth of society that account for the push and pull, conflict and resolution that drives history forward or sometimes back. <clears throat> like many mainstream historians, revisionists accused Marxism of thereby being economic determinism. <clears throat> Anyone with the least familiarity, however, knows that Marxist theory requires the integration of non-economic with economic factors to see society as a totality. We could hardly speak of social movements or revolution if it were not for the subjective factor in history. But social class action also requires an expression. The particular ideological formulations and beliefs advanced at the time, in conjunction with the lived experience of the participants, shape competing political programs. As the great Frederick Douglass put it, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. The revisionist's major target was the English historian Christopher Hill, who had been singularly responsible for establishing the Marxist class analysis of the English Revolution in the mid 20th century. But there was a weakness in Hill's presentation that the revisionists took prodigious advantage of to discredit Marxism and claim that no revolution had ever taken place in the early 1640s. Hill had attributed leadership of the revolution to what he called the progressive gentry in the House of Commons, a group he amalgamated with the cap capitalist bourgeoisie. Due to inflation, the living standards of landlords who lived off traditionally low and contractually fixed rents were falling. While nobles were immune to arrest for non-payment of debts, Many gentry looked for ways to rationalize their country holdings, and they were more willing than nobles to take an active managerial role in manufacture, trade, or agricultural improvements. The so-called progressive gentry did play a progressive political role, but they were not conscious revolutionaries. They were still landowners, highly privileged, untitled aristocrats, junior partners in the ruling feudal class, who oppressed the peasant tenants who lived and worked on their land. To protect their living standards, landlords attempted to drastically raise rents, restore medieval fees, or enclose their lands for efficiency, which forced their tenants to abandon farms that many had worked for generations. Those gentry whom Hill called progressive were therefore in a contradictory position with a foot in each of two different social systems, feudalism and capitalism, and were as a result politically modern. Throughout the lead up to the Civil War, and for a time even after, the gentlemen MPs who dominated the House of Commons disingenuously claimed they were not against the king, but only his evil counselors. In August 1642, for example, the same month the king declared war on parliament, Oliver Cromwell's first commission to raise a cavalry troop read that the fight was for, quote, king and parliament. In the polarized and irreconcilable struggle for political power, this was ultimately an untenable position. What these gentlemen opposed were Charles I's moves, moves toward absolute monarchy, which interfered with their participation in capitalist enterprises. It was never their aim to overthrow the king or to dissolve the old social order, but only to reform the existing feudal government in their favor by bringing the monarchy and state church under their own control. For this reason, they supported democratic rights of property and the person. 
to quote from my book, the more the government attempted to centralize power, the more of a hindrance it was to the expansion of capitalist ventures. The more the improving gentry insisted on doing as they liked with their own property, the more they resisted that centralization. This was the material basis of the legal political antagonism between the king and an important section of the feudal ruling class. Taxation was a major issue. The gentry MPs jealously insisted on their privilege to control it, for if the king could levy taxes at will, what need was there for a parliament? In a money economy, taxation is crucial. Without it, armies cannot be paid, and control of armed forces means control of state power. These issues first came into serious dispute under Elizabeth's successor, James I. In 1625, when James died, Charles I, a devoted feudalist, inherited the throne. He was immediately at odds with Parliament over religion, foreign policy, and his demands for money. After 1629, he refused to call another Parliament for the next 11 years. Charles's imposition of his personal rule was more than just his ambition for an absolute monarchy, although it was certainly that. It was an attempt to resolve the social contradiction by freezing what had become an open rupture in the feudal ruling class. During this period, Puritans were purged from the Church of England, their teachings suppressed and ministers persecuted. Any non-official religious gathering was illegal, participants subject to arrest and punishment. Gathered churches of like-minded congregants met secretly in people's homes or in fields outside the city. By the time Elizabeth died in 1603, Puritanism had come to have a general influence on English society. Inheritors of the Calvinist Reformation on the continent, Puritans were Orthodox Protestants who demanded a thoroughgoing purge of ch in church practices of anything that smacked of Catholicism. Their individualist ideology was perfectly consonant with capitalist entrepreneurship. They preached the dignity of work and severely condemned idleness. They preached, sorry, which conveniently dovetailed with the need to instill labor discipline. On a population that had recently lived in the countryside by the weather and was quite unused to the regular rhythms of a manufacturing society. Puritanism was a trans class movement. Many gentry and even a few nobles were Puritans or Puritan sympathizers. But it was most popular and took its most radical forms among the very large class of London's middling people. London's Puritan preachers thus became a significant part of the revolutionary leadership. The other key component was the new class of Atlantic merchants that developed during the late 1620s and 30s. Up to this point, Foreign trade was monopolized by the royally chartered overseas trading companies, such as the East India and Levant companies. Their limited number of investors, the fabulously wealthy bourgeois merchant princes, completely monopolized foreign trade to the South and East and also regulated domestic production of many commodities, especially textiles. They served as bankers to the aristocracy who were often indebted to them for large sums. They supported the monarchy with customs duties, loans, and gifts, and this made each dependent on the other. As the oligarchic rulers of towns, especially London, they enforced crown policies. The Atlantic merchants, by contrast, were able to become wealthy after 1625 by trading in tobacco and provisions to Virginia and other English possessions in the New World under the rough and ready conditions of free trade. Unlike monopoly company merchants, therefore, they were not beholden to the king for their wealth, and most were radically Puritan in politics and religion, known as independents, aka congregationalists. During the 1630s, they allied with Puritan aristocrats to found new colonies for refugees from Charles's religious persecution, such as Massachusetts Bay and what became the modern state of Belize. They aggressively attacked Spanish interests in the Caribbean and interloped on the old monopoly company preserves all the way to the East Indies. In 
as Republicans or semi-Republicans, they became leaders of the Puritan movement in London due to their extensive commercial and personal ties with middling class producers and retailers. They would come to provide Parliament's financing and administrative organization before and during the Civil War, giving them outsized influence over it, which they used to push for active pr prosecution of the war against the king. They were, in short, the bourgeois vanguard of the English Revolution. By itself, the House of Commons did not have any way to implement changes to the feudal system and could not overcome the king. It was only the support of the London Puritan movement that made it possible. There was thus a political alliance between a majority of the gentry in the House of Commons with the Atlantic merchants and Puritan preachers in London, which gave the gentry confidence they could control the popular movement. This alliance of landowners and big merchants introduced a skew into the revolutionary process that is responsible for the hybrid outcome of the monarchy and nobility sharing power with the bourgeoisie after the revolution in 1688. It was because of this alliance that the revolutionary leadership failed to mobilize the masses against the aristocratic landowners as a whole, as the French Revolution later did. This is why France today is a republic, and Britain, ludicrously and expensively, is still a kingdom. Charles's personal rule during the 1630s was characterized by repeated attempts to illegally impose taxes without the benefit of parliament, his shift of the Church of England in a sharply more Catholic direction, suspension of laws against Catholics, promotion of monopolies and other economic distortions, continuation of a pro-Spanish foreign policy, and attempts to reinforce social rankings and stymie social mobility, a Sisyphean labor, but one with dire consequences. <clears throat> In 1637, Star Chamber convicted three Puritan preachers of sedition. They were sentenced to having their ears cut off, cheeks branded, and imprisonment for life. Gentry MPs were shocked at this treatment of a physician a clergyman and a lawyer, members of the learned professions. The same year, the first Vatican representative in nearly 80 years was received at court. Charles promoted conservatives in the Church of England, known as Arminians, who upheld church ritual and hierarchy and the divine right of kings and opposed preaching and free thinking sermons. In 1633, the Arminian William Laud was appointed Archbishop of Canterbury head of the English church. Many clergy were appointed to government posts and Catholics to offices at court. Laud's persecution of Puritans forced some to emigrate to Holland or America, such as those later called the Pilgrims. And all of this was taking place while the Thirty Years' War over religion was still raging on the continent. These moves increased fears of popery within the ruling class among Protestant nobles and gentry, many of whose lands had belonged to the Catholic Church before Henry VIII's Reformation. The acute sense of Protestantism under siege made both gentry and middling people diehard opponents of Laud and Arminianism, thus enabling their early unity. Charles's imposition of arbitrary taxes increased opposition by gentry, middling people, and Atlantic merchants. To reinforce an orderly feudal society, the king attempted to impose episcopacy, ruled by the bishops, on Presbyterian Scotland. The Scots Kirk promulgated a new national covenant, rejecting bishops and royal control, and raised an army to defend it. In August 1640, they invaded England and defeated a motley force Charles had thrown together to make the Scots submit. By the fall of 1640, the government was in a financial, political, and military crisis, and Charles had lost the confidence of a large section of the peerage, as well as the gentry, not to mention the furious opposition of the Puritan middling people, who largely sympathized with the Scots Presbyterians. Unable to secure new loans, the king was forced to call a new parliament. The four MPs elected for London were all parliamentary Puritan merchants. They became the critical link between the London citizens movement and the parliamentary opposition in the House of Commons, tying the two together. 
On the 3rd of November, 1640, what would become known as the Long Parliament began. It would govern for the next 13 years. Due to some expansion of the franchise in the 1620s, a number of middle or lower gentry were elected, such as Oliver Cromwell. These men were more likely to be Puritan and somewhat more radical in their views. Very few of the well-off gentry MPs who dominated the House of Commons were Republican, much less Democrats. Quote, many of the nobility and gentry were contented to serve his, the king's, arbitrary designs if they might have leave to insult over such as were a, of a lower order, wrote the Republican MP Edward Ludlow. House of Commons leader John Pym and the opposition gentry believed that by placing limits on the crown and bishops, Parliament would be able to control His Majesty's government. They had no intention of dismembering the established church or abolishing monarchy, and hoped to be appointed to government posts themselves. There was only one small problem with the gentry's reform program. It required agreement by the king. Without the backing of the more conservative House of Lords, which it did not have, it was unable to force changes in the feudal political system on its own. The only alternative was to rely on the Puritan middling class movement, but this would alienate many of Pym's own supporters. The Commons immediately began their campaign against the King's evil counselors. A month after convening, they impeached the two most important, the Earl of Strafford, governor of Ireland, and William Laud, Archbishop of Canterbury. Parliament freed the 1637 religious martyrs of Star Chamber. A joyous crowd of 10,000 accompanied their re-entry into London, sending shockwaves through the royal court. The church courts no longer functioned, freeing the people from prosecution for sin. Puritans began to preach openly again. On 11 December, a petition with 15,000 signatures was presented to the Commons calling for the abolition of the Episcopal State Church, root and branch. This revolutionary program came from London's middling people, led by militant Puritan preachers and radical Atlantic merchants. Like all revolutionary demands, it could not be accommodated in the existing social system. The church was mirrored and interpenetrated with the secular government, the king, the head of both. Abolition of episcopacy would mean the fall of the monarchy. The Puritan movement was intent on smashing the power of the church and court hierarchies so they could decide for themselves how to run their religious and economic lives without government interference. Puritanism was thus a revolutionary movement against feudalism. Few MPs supported abolition of episcopacy, but most were opposed to the Catholicizing innovations by Archbishop Laud. Thus, two different political programs, one reform, one revolutionary, were in competition, yet their leaders were in a de facto political alliance that grew tighter as time went on. They mutually reinforced each other, creating a duel for power with the king's government. In March 1641, the Commons voted to remove bishops from the House of Lords and bar them from holding secular offices. Archbishop Laud tried to secretly flee London, but was stopped by a crowd and sent to the Tower. But the King could still dismiss Parliament at any time. Ostensibly to, re to reassure potential moneylenders, the Commons unanimously passed a bill that Parliament would remain in session until it voted to dissolve itself. The trial of Strafford in the House of Lords was the burning issue of the moment, but as it dragged on, Puritans began a petition and agitation for justice for Strafford. The King ordered the anti-Strafford petition suppressed, but the same day a bill of attainder was introduced in the Commons, condemning Strafford to death by act of Parliament. Ten days later, 10,000 people brought another mass petition to the Commons. Presented by radical Puritan merchants, it cited the Popish army Strafford had raised in Ireland, again called for church reform, and the death of, quote, notorious offenders. The Commons passed the Bill of Attainder the same day. Those voting against it were denounced as traitors in placards posted up in London and Westminster. It should be noted that Bills of Attainder are explicitly prohibited in the U.S. Constitution. 
there were discussions between the king and certain army officers to march the army against in the north, still against Scotland, to London to suppress the citizens and release Strafford. On the 1st of May, the king sent 100 armed men to the tower to rescue him. They were only prevented because the officer in charge refused to admit them. The populace was enraged at rumors of this secret army plot and the attempt on the tower. Two days later, 10,000 mainly respectable citizens demonstrated at parliament. They shouted justice and execution at the Lords as they passed through the crowd. The Lord Mayor issued a prohibition on tumults, but a large crowd of lower class mechanic folk returned next day, bringing staves and some broadswords with them. Amid tensions and fears of a coup d'etat by the King, Pym openly revealed in the Commons what he knew about discussions at court to use the army against the people in Parliament. As a result, four royalist gentlemen fled to the continent the next day. The army plot alienated even some prominent supporters of the king, who feared that it entailed the dissolution of parliament and or a move toward restoring Catholicism. The House of Lords passed the Bill of Attainder, with all of the Catholic members absenting themselves, and the bill against dissolution of parliament without its consent. Armed demonstrations began next day at Whitehall Palace. Demoralized, Charles approved the Attainder. Strafford was executed and the streets were filled with people rejoicing. The ruling class was now openly split. The victory was obviously the people's. It was a dress rehearsal for what was to come. In reaction, a royalist party of order began to form. The London government was rapidly losing the ability to rule in the old way. The trained bands were a citizen's militia and many sympathized or participated with the Puritan crowds. <clears throat> a, member of, <clears throat> a member of the Watermen's Guild, <clears throat> quote, told that he ought to be obedient to law, order, and the Lord Mayor, answered that it was Parliament time now, and the Lord Mayor was but their slave. This identification of the London populace with the House of Commons was a source of strength to the Puritan middling class movement and the seed of its eventual betrayal. The open conflict between the Royal Court and the Commons, backed by the artisan workers movement, began a struggle for power, raising the question, which class would rule? In the summer of 1641, the prerogative courts of Star Chamber and High Commission were abolished, ending the feudal government's judicial terror against the citizenry. It also provided the security, not to say sanctity, of private property, so essential to capitalist society. Merchants, tradesmen, or gentry no longer had to fear that judgments awarded in the common courts might be summarily overturned by the crown. The writ of habeas corpus was also reinforced. The House of Commons ordered altar rails, communion tables, candles, and images removed from local churches, and the elimination of superstitious rit rituals their orders were rejected by the lords, who upheld established church practices. The conflicting orders caused violent disputes around the country. Collaboration between the commons and the London movement sharply contrasted with the split between the two houses of parliament, each of which contained minorities in sympathy with the other. In September 1641, Charles signed a new treaty in Scotland, and the Scots army left England a year after crossing the border. This put Pym and company in a quandary. The Scots army had been their only check on the crown. The king obviously could not be trusted with the safety of the house, much less to carry out reforms. Many MPs, however, considered the citizens' religious program to be seditious, as indeed it was. On 1 November 1641, Parliament learned of a Catholic rebellion in Ireland. A massacre of Protestants in Ulster unleashed a torrent of condemnation. That the Irish lords and people were retaking their lands, forcibly confiscated from them, cut no ice in England. There were sketchy reports and speculation about the possibility of Catholic uprisings or terrorist acts on English soil. Panic over popish plots raced around the country. <clears throat> 
The Irish uprising forced him's hand. All sides agreed on the necessity to raise a new army to subdue the Irish and relieve the Protestants. The question was, who would control it? By 41 votes, the Commons stipulated that Parliament had to approve all royal officers appointed by the King. Events were pushing the MPs toward revolution. Most were largely in agreement about the reform program, but a large minority opposed alliance with the London middling working class movement to achieve it. For Parliament, however, it was rely on the people or surrender and go home. The alliance of landed gentry with bourgeois Puritan merchants and ministers gave the Commons leadership good reason to believe they could control the citizens movement, but it was nonetheless a step full of risk. The annual elections to the London Common Council took place on 21 December. The Royalists were so decisively defeated by parliamentary Puritans that the council, council's leadership became lame ducks. Two days later, Charles replaced the Lieutenant of the Tower, who had prevented Strafford's rescue with a Royalist officer of ill repute. This provoked continuing disturbances in the city by teenage apprentices. All shops were closed. The Commons received a petition from 30,000 apprentices, again calling for root and branch reform of the church and declaring they would fight against a, quote, royal coup. The Lords refused to take action against the new lieutenant, so the Commons passed a declaration disclaiming responsibility for any, quote, blood which is likely to be spilt. On 26 December, the Lord Mayor was forced to tell the King that he could not keep order in the city unless the new lieutenant at the tower was replaced. The King was compelled to give in, but he wrote a proclamation banning assemblies. The next day, a crowd of several hundred citizens chanting, no bishops, went to the House of Lords. Bishops were jostled and some of their gowns were torn. The now ex-lieutenant and other officers were inside the hall seeking back pay and new commissions. Some half dozen attacked the crowd with swords. They were driven off by John Lilburn, leading some sailors with truncheons and backed by the crowd throwing stones. This was the first actual combat between the two sides. Lilburn, already a well-known activist, would later become a leader of the radically democratic group, the Levelers. At news of the fight, hundreds of armed people went directly to parliament. Some apprentices who were arrested were freed by their comrades. The House of Lords ordered the crowd to go home, forbid them to assemble at Parliament. The King issued his own proclamation to the same effect, authorizing the trained bands to shoot to kill if there was resistance. But as night fell, the House of Lords was still surrounded by 10,000 people, armed with halberds and staves, carrying torches and chanting, no bishops, no papist lords. The crowd searched the Lord's carriages as they left to see if bishops were hiding in them. An even larger crowd appeared the following day and prevented bishops from landing at Westminster by river. Some apprentices were arrested and taken to Westminster Abbey to be questioned by the Archbishop of York. A large group led by John Lilburn and Sir Richard Wiseman went to secure their release. They were attacked by 40 gentlemen with swords and pistols. Lilburn was wounded and Wiseman was killed. The next day, an armed demonstration, including men of quality, shouting, no bishops, no popish lords, appeared early at Parliament, then went to the palace at Whitehall. Gentlemen guards again attacked the crowd with swords. The famous derogatory epithets cavalier from the Spanish caballero, implying a Catholic mercenary and drowned head meaning short-haired commoners, as most gentlemen wore their hair long, were exchanged for the first time. Reports of armed men being gathered by the King at Whitehall and Westminster Abbey made clear a new army plot was in the offing. Young gentlemen of the nobility and gentry rallied to the King and the party of order. The guard at Whitehall was increased and defenses strengthened. A military coup seemed imminent. On the 3rd of January, 1642, the King charged five leaders of the House of Commons and one Lord with treason. The next day, Charles personally led a retinue of 100 royal officers to arrest John Pym and four other leading MPs on the floor of the Commons. No monarch had ever before even entered the House, 
much less with the intent to arrest sitting members. Warned in advance, the intended prisoners hid in a radical district of London. The king was forced to retreat empty-handed. The entire house then voted to adjourn to London, thereby relying on the protection of the ordinary citizens. Aldermen and sheriffs closed the gates to the city and placed chains across streets to impede horses. The mass of people armed themselves and stood watching the streets to defend the five members. The same day, the London Common Council set up a committee of safety. All of the councillors elected to the committee were supporters of Parliament, including nine Atlantic merchants. Two nights later, a rumor quickly spread that soldiers were approaching the city. The citizens again went on alert and the trained bands were called out without the Lord Mayor's authorization. Some 100,000 armed men went into the streets while women built barricades and prepared pots of boiling water to use against the enemy. The attack never came, but with the armed citizens and trained bands behind it, the Committee of Safety on, beha on behalf of the Common Council was in command of the city and the Royalists were helpless. On the night of 10 January 1642, Charles and his family fled London. The five MPs and House of Commons returned to Westminster the next day in triumph, cheered by crowds along the route. The anti-absolutist alliance between the people of London in arms, the Puritan merchants in the city government, and the reformed gentry in the House of Commons had been sealed. Having won London, it was now necessary for Parliament to gain control of the rest of the country. In March 1642, Parliament announced the implementation of a militia bill, despite the King's refusal to, re to approve it, quote, for the safety and defense of the kingdom. The bill gave Parliament the right to appoint the Lord's Lieutenant, who controlled the trained bands in each county, instead of Charles. From now on, parliamentary ordinances had the force of law. Parliament had been transformed from a feudal council to an independent bourgeois institution. Political power in London had passed to the Alliance of the Gentry and the Atlantic Merchants. The purge of bishops from the House of Lords confirmed the upper house as subordinate to the lower. The feudal political system was shattered, and England would never be the same again. I'm going to end the narrative here to make some concluding observations. My book goes on to describe the political situation in London under the revolutionary government, how and why it deteriorated, what it was like in the countryside through the early stages of the Civil War, and the severe political crisis <clears throat> that occurred in July 1643, when all of Parliament's armies were defeated and the Commons very nearly voted to surrender to the King. <clears throat> At the end of the Civil War, the Commonwealth, a republic by another name, brought the bourgeois revolution to fruition that the money interest had long ago become infinitely more important to the national economy than land ownership, was shown by the effects of the economic depressions in the 1620s and 30s. This meant that by the time Charles I took the throne, only the traditional forms of the outmoded feudal political system remained, hollowed out of any real social content. When the twin crises in, in state and church had been spawned, the king was left with only his courtiers, the bishops and monopolists to support him. It is an axiom of Marxism that revolutions do not occur without a corresponding change in the social consciousness of the revolutionary class. In London, this was manifested in the fall of 1642 and continued in the spring of 43 when nearly the entire population of London enthusiastically turned out to build extensive fortifications for defense against the King's army around the city and its suburbs. Up to 20,000 people a day participated, including women and children, organized by livery company or parish, receiving no pay, only food. The walls were made of earth and timber, with trenches and watchtowers, and they rose 18 feet high and extended for 18 miles. The revolutionary city government had reorganized and upgraded the militia in the trained bands, whose officers were now free trade merchants and liverymen. In October 1642, they voluntarily joined the army under Essex to fight at the, ba the Battle of Edgehill, where they played a leading role. The next month, 
they helped to prevent a quick cavalier victory at Turnham Green outside London. In August 1643, they again joined Essex in the long march to relieve the siege of Gloucester, a hundred miles away. They were forced into battle on the way back to London at Newbury, where even the royalist historian Lord Clarendon credited them with saving the day. It was the political consciousness engendered by the, Rus by the London Revolution that made them the most dedicated defenders of it. The intervention of the citizens' movement in London at decisive moments pressured the House of Commons, or at moments of greatest threat, protected its members with arms in hand. From this comes the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. In the Federalist Papers, both Alexander Hamilton and James Madison argued that militias, defined as citizens with arms, were the guarantee of the people's liberties, including from the federal government if necessary. Puritan and Protestant antipathy to Catholics must not be conflated with the dead-end inter-ethnic and religious wars in our own decaying era, particularly since the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the 17th century, the Catholic Church had been the dominant institution, tightly integrated with feudalism for a millennium. They could not be distinguished because they were not distinguishable. Not until the revolution of 1688 would bourgeois secularism be confirmed in its essentials. Only once feudalism had decisively given way to capitalism and the landowners had been reconciled to the political rule of the bourgeoisie, could any form of equal tolerance for Catholics be envisioned. It would take another 140 years. The actual events at, this, at the time exposed the empty claims of revisionist historians as absurd frauds, but their methods have a madness a deliberate reactionary defense of the minority class of exploiters and oppressors of the majority in the here and now. To study history is not a matter of applying rigid rules, analyzing isolated phenomena, or carefully making lists of pros and cons. It is a matter of regarding society as a whole, I'm sorry, as a whole entity in motion, in a framework of development, which does not occur linearly, but which recognizes when qualitative changes occur and can analyze the consequences. This is historical materialism, the method that teaches us to appreciate contradiction in the evidence of history itself. Thank you. Okay, well, well thank you so much, Michael. Uh, this really kind of uh, made the whole thing very real. For most of us, I think, and we could almost like we're, we're there uh, as witnesses. So again, uh, thank you. And we're going to turn to um, a discussion in just a few minutes. But before we do that, um, I just want to remind you that we meet every Sunday morning. Uh, if you want to get on our mailing list, go to our website, icssmarks.org, and you can sign up for our mailing list. Uh, next week, we go uh, right up to current events, and we talk. We have uh, Pierre Le Bosset, um speaking on the crisis in Haiti and the popular movement. Uh, that's followed on uh, November thirteenth with our very own Raj Sahai uh, on the challenge of Alexander Gugin and the fourth political um, theory, which is uh, very much in in uh, uh, relevant, I think. And uh, Raj, you want to say anything about that before we move, go forward? I, yeah, just uh, quickly, I plan to explain what is fourth political theory and what is the philosophy and ideology behind it and how should Marxists view it and a critique of it. That's what I intend to do. Okay, we're, we're looking forward to that. Uh, Raj, and uh, we really appreciate your labors on that. Uh, Sunday, November 20th, um, the comprehensive crisis in, US, in the US and the revolutionary way forward. These are our uh, new friends from the Midwestern Marxists will be speaking. Take a break for um, Thanksgiving weekend. We'll have no um, program. But then we'll move forward with other things. Uh, 
possibly something on communism and anti-communism. And uh, on December 11th, Iran's role in the anti-imperialist struggle. So we have some good programs coming up. Be sure to sign up for our uh, weekly reminders at uh, icssmarks.org. And um, although we are very frugal, um, we do uh, need uh, some funds now and then. And, and Richard, do you have anything to say on that? Um, no, not very much. I just uh, posted in the the chat uh, a um, some uh, information on how to contribute. The same information is available on our website, um, and you and in your announcement newsletter. So thank you for your generosity and support. Okay, so now we will turn to our uh, discussion period. I know people have lots of questions and comments. And um, so if you uh, please uh, indicate, I, I will be keeping a stack. So if you uh, have something to say on the matter, uh, please think about what you had to say and try to limit your comments or question uh, to two minutes, um, certainly no more than three. Uh, but uh, please raise your hands for um, uh, comments, questions. I see no hands up yet there. Raj yeah. is up there. Uh, four hands, four hands. Sharon is number one on the list. Okay, I don't see Followed Sharon. By up here yeah, but, sure. uh, first and then Richard Wright and then Grover Fur, then myself. Whoa, how come you see these things and I don't? Um, uh, <laughs> Gene, put it on gallery view. Is it, do you have gallery view on? I have gallery view, but I don't see hands up. Um, but let me go with that list. Uh, so okay. we have Sharon. Thank Richard, you. Oh. Richard W. And Raj. Yeah, Grover, Grover, for, was oh, Grover, is Grover here? Yeah. No, his here. Uh, name is here. Okay. <laughs> okay, Sharon, Richard W., Grover, Fur, and anyone else is, needs to be on there. Okay. Uh, thank well, you so remember much. Remember that we uh, try to be civil to one another. We have a comradely discussion, but we are on a free-for-all as far as uh, facts and, and interpretations. So, Sharon. You're up. Everybody keep to two minutes. Uh, the yeah, paper. try to keep it to two minutes. Uh, I will... Yeah, you already said that. Let's go. <laughs> Please don't interrupt. Uh, we I did... won't. Okay, Sharon. Thank you very much, Michael. This is really fascinating and raises a number of, of ideas in my mind. Um, I, I was struck by what you said about like the US Civil War, the revolutions in, in England uh, re resonate right down to today. I'm personally very interested in how um, institutional memory, I guess you would call it, I, for me, it's like more like familial memory comes down generation after generation and influences the political ideas of the younger people. And I've been in touch with how my own political ideas came from my ancestors. Let me just put it that way. But um, what I'm wondering is, oh, well, I wanted to say that you mentioned Belize as another British colony. We in North America think that the only British colonies were United States and Canada, but that was, that's definitely not true. I think also that the English speaking people who live in the, the Atlantic coast region of Nicaragua were um, have the same origin, at, not to mention the Falkland Islands. I don't know, there's a few others. But um, what I'm wondering whether any of the, the struggle at all, any of, of what was going on in this revolution had to do with abolition. You mean of slavery? Of, of slavery. And the other thing I'm I'm wondering is how many people died? 
because you know the civil war one of the resonant resonances of the civil war is the enormous casualties that american families can still re remember the pe their people who who died thank you sure um so maybe just quickly um no abolition didn't exist in that period as far as i know um the uh in fact you have to remember that slavery started not with the british but with the spanish and portuguese to south america primarily um to work in the mines and on the lead of uh, the plantations um the it was absolutely those same Atlantic merchants who around 1640, as tobacco became uh, the tobacco uh, import trade into Britain uh, became saturated, um, started exploring um, other avenues, uh, one of which was sugar. And uh, sh sugar production uh, had been brought to um, I believe probably Barbados uh, and later spread to uh, the Bahamas, um, all of which were owned by England, um, by Portuguese Jews from Brazil, interestingly enough. Um, really? Sh sh sugar uh, production uh, was, it wasn't simply a matter, uh, a, a, a producing sugar from sugar cane was virtually an industrial, uh, almost an industrial procedure. Um, it was complicated, it was long, it had to be done right, uh, it took a lot of labor. Um, and um, this was, um, uh, so the Atlantic merchants uh, got into the slave trade uh, and into investing in these sugar plantations, these sugar industries on the islands, uh, and enormously, uh, became enormously wealthy out of it, uh, and it grew and grew. Um, so this was, um, uh, but so it was rather new and um, simply see, seen as, um, you know, another investment, of course. Um, this is uh, capitalism at its very worst. Um, the, um, yeah, so, and as you point out, England, of course, did have mothers. Uh, they owned Bermuda. They owned Bermuda. Um, Belize uh, and Massachusetts were uh, founded as Puritan, by, by Puritan noblemen, gentry, Atlantic merchants, uh, as, refuge, as refuges for, uh, for Puritans fleeing from uh, the persecution uh, during the 1630s under Charles and Laud. And that's, that's why Belize is the only country in Central America that speaks English. Um, oh, Nicaragua. Nicaraguan speaks Spanish mostly, no? No, on the east coast of Nicaragua, there are English speakers. Oh, I've, well. I've met them. <laughs> I, I, I believe you. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, uh, any, um, any major event like a civil oh you asked about the casualties i i can't recall the exact number it was very large much like the american civil war uh the casualty rate uh in in uh in england uh in the 17th century civil war was enormous so the, the country was utterly devastated um which made it all the more problematical uh after uh, after the war after the king was executed with the foundation of the commonwealth one reason the commonwealth didn't last terribly long about three years um was because the situation in the country was so bad uh and um uh the political ramifications of that uh led to Cr cromwell's protectorate uh and ultimately the restoration of charles ii um, but even the restoration, uh, you can ask about this, but I'll throw it out. Uh, even the restoration didn't um, restore everything to the way it was before the Civil War, before the London Revolution. Uh, England was still a very different place as a result. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, 
stick to the stack. We have Richard W., uh, Grover Fur, Janet, and uh, Raj on the list. And uh, if you want to get on that list, please um, <coughs> raise your hand. But uh, uh, Richard W., right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michael, for a, a nice presentation. Um, as I was listening to it, a couple of things stuck out in my in my head. Um, one of which is you mentioned early on that England at the time was, uh, to put it in Samir means uh, terminology, a periphery of, or a periphery of of um, Antwerp. Yeah. Uh, and my one one of the questions that crossed my mind is, um, is what. I believe that the Hanseatic League extended down to Antwerp, and that that, that they were that they were doing a lot of political um, intrigue, if you will. And if they had any any influence uh, at that time, I think I think the Hanseatic League were a little bit earlier than what than the period you're talking about. But nevertheless, they they were a, a merchant class, and and uh, which leads me to my second question, or second observation. Um, and that is, is that you 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 mentioned um, uh, well you mentioned that uh, the large member of the of the, um, the revolutionary crowd, if you will, uh, were the apprentice, um, and and um, and I, and that I get the impression that 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 this was not a proletarian revolution so much as it was a petty bourgeois pro, uh, revolution, which leads us into the United States, of course, you know, and and. Ultimately, the the uh, you know, um, the, uh, the Boston Tea Party, et cetera, which is very much a a, a petty bourgeois uh, rebellion. Um, so, um, what what impact, if any, did the proletariat of this? Well, in point of fact, the proletariat weren't very well developed anyway, because it was still principally an agrarian. Uh, uh, actually, it was an agrarian international economy. Uh, actually, the progressive forces at that time were uh, coming out of the Hanseatic League and were the were the merchant class. Anyways, I'll just shut up there and, and let you comment. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Those are those are very interesting uh, issues. Um, so yes, you're right um, on both counts. Um, there was no proletariat in the modern sense in England in this period. Um, as we know, as Marx taught us, um, the working class, the proletariat, is created by capitalism. Well, we're talking about very embryonic, a very early stage in, in the development of capitalism, um, one that is, moreover, still uh, saddled with a feudal political system and social system. Um, the um, the very small early manufactories that I was talking about at the beginning, um, you know, uh, maybe a half dozen workers would come to a central point and they each worked on their own loom um, uh, and were paid their wages. Um, there, um, there were various workers who, who did work for wages. Um, in fact, not a not particularly a small number, um, but their their livings, their their employment was often very insecure. I mean, the the um, people like laborers and porters, uh, these were day laborers. If they didn't get hired that day, they didn't eat that day. Um, and all of these people were terribly poor. Um, there simply was no uh, wages, in fact, were set by ju the justices of the peace, who were very frequently employers themselves or, um, you know, with, had ties to uh, uh, the rest of the feudal social system. Um, so wages were extremely low. These people were terribly poor. Um, and um, uh, those that uh, some of them who did respond and follow uh, the middling class people, uh, the petty bourgeoisie, the uh, small producers, um, uh, were very dedicated. Um, you know, this this looked like a good thing to some of them, but but they were so 
uh, uh, ground down that that they weren't they they had no independent political uh, force. Um, so yes, the apprentices were absolutely these were um, uh, petty bourgeois. The the middling class, whether they were the apprentices, who by the way under the law were servants of the masters. Um, or the journeymen who worked for wages, again, not terribly high, unless somebody was, you know, a master looked particularly favorable on somebody. Um, uh, this was a petty bourgeois stratum. They worked on their own. Again, there was almost no division of labor to speak of. You, somebody made a pair of shoes, you made a pair of shoes. You've been, when, until you, you kept at it until you finished. Um, and, um, uh, this is this is not. There was nothing in the way of uh, the collective labor that was necessary uh, later on in in nineteenth, uh, uh, late eighteenth, nineteenth century factories uh, where that took place. Um, so yeah, there simply there simply was no proletariat as such in this period. The Hanseatic League, yes, you're quite right. Um, they had been trading in the uh, uh, north amongst the northern countries for uh, about 300 years, um, and in fact, they carried a considerable portion of the um, uh, of the wool to the Low Countries from England um, in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, when Elizabeth came in, however. Uh, she largely cut them out in favor to, in order to favor English merchants, um, and this, of course, helped the merchants a great deal, uh, the the native merchants. Um, but um, uh, the the uh, and it helped to sustain them because by the end, by towards the end of the second half of the 16th century, the cloth export trade, clothing export trade, was beginning to slow down. Uh, somewhat, and uh, so cutting out the uh, the German merchants made a, made a difference. Okay, well, well thank you, and we'll move forward. Um, our, our, our next uh, person on the list is Grover Fur, followed by Janet Corbin and Raj. So Grover, it's okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> Anybody yes. hear me? Can yeah, find? Yeah. A little louder. A little louder, just about as loud as I can go. Okay, um, that's a great talk, and um, Michael, and Thank uh, you. I'm gonna, I've ordered your book for our library and, and so forth. Uh, and I have a couple of little things to note, and then I wanna ask you two questions. Uh, first of all, Sharon, uh, I'm gonna put online the, a link to an article called uh, well, the, uh, the Levelers and Irish Freedom in 1650 51, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Cromwell decided to invade Ireland for various reasons. And there was actually protest against taking away the freedom of the Irish uh, among uh, among many of the soldiers. And there's at least one article about it that I'm aware of. And I can, I can send you that, the link to that article. Uh, uh, in the later period of the Civil War and thereafter, there was this very interesting period where the, where, um, where the real lower classes, you know, the, the common soldiers in the army and the, the peasants who were fighting against enclosure movement and so forth, uh, found a voice and had uh, and had some uh, political agency through various spokespersons. And Michael's not talking about that period, but that's a fascinating period. And uh, and so there's this there's this very radical aspect and sort of lower class, not proletarian, the lower class aspect of it to this English Revolution, which is. Uh, is beyond the scope of Michael's talk today. I have a couple of questions for Michael. Um, one is I'd like you to just briefly uh, summarize, again, your, your disagreements with Christopher Hill, who's the great figure here, and I've read a lot of his stuff over the years. And secondly, I wish you could briefly say something about why the hell the revolution, the, the restoration, you know, what- what? I'm sorry, what, could you repeat the, that? Why the restoration, 1658 to 1660? Why did that happen? Briefly. So one, disagreements with Hill, your main disagreements with Hill. Secondly, uh, you know, why did it all come to a crashing end? That's it. Okay. 
Well, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> well, now, first, we're just two remarks. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, you don't have to respond to those. But. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, the levelers were, of course, very important. Um, they, um, my book ends before the organized leveler party um, right. uh, comes on the scene. Right. Uh, but its leaders do make appearances and its significance is mentioned. Um, they were uh, they were the uh, political party representing the interests of the petty bourgeois middling people against those of the larger capitalists and merchants. Um, um, uh, by the way, it, it hasn't come up before, but I should mention that um, the independent peasants called the yeomen uh, and even uh, uh, peasant tenants called copyholders um, were uh, often part of the middling people, certainly the yeomen were, um, and the levelers also, at, at least at times, had demands uh, in, for their benefit. Um, the levelers were radical Democrats. Um, what made them particular, particularly important was that they were the first to develop a secular political program um, based on their radical and democratic ideas of sovereignty being derived from the people, et cetera. Um, and this was quite different from the Puritan attack, which was based on religion, such as the Reuben Branch uh, petition. Um, they were Republicans. Um, they were for they wanted a major expansion in voting rights, electoral reform, um, religious tolerance, uh, abolition of debtors' prison and tithes. Uh, they were in you know for their day they were uh, the biggest and, and best and uh, were seen as a real threat. Uh, certainly by Oliver Cromwell, amongst others. Um, my, uh, and yes, uh, in fact, it was some of the levelers who influenced the army um, against uh, going to Ireland um, uh, after the Civil War. Uh, the, there was a lot of, um, the, for complicated political reasons, um, the House of Commons uh, had um, made uh, this a condition, uh, enlistment for Ireland, a condition on being paid for their past service. The issue of pay was was chronic and, and really came to a head in this period. Um, but um, so many of them were, were very unhappy at, at uh, being forced into this uh, situation, this, this position. Um, my disagreement with Hill, well, as I explained, you know, he, he had this idea that the revolution, that there was a revolutionary party in the House of Commons. And he later backed away and said, no, obviously that's, that can't be the case. Um, what my book does is to attempt to provide the, um, the answer that I, I think he should have given. Uh, to his critics at the time, but didn't. Um, what he did was to kind of back away and, and from, um, from a full Marxist understanding uh, into, uh, he, he offered a, a, uh, an, a, an objectivist uh, analysis saying, well, uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the feudal system is, is falling apart and um, capitalism is rising and it just kind of all happened and capitalism and then, you know, these guys came along and, and it all stabilized again. Um, that's not how exactly he, how he put it, how he puts it, but that's in effect what it meant. Um, and I talk about this more in the preface of my book, um, quoting from, from Hill. Um, so it, it was an objectification of the situation because he didn't have a way of answering, uh, well, where did the subjective uh, uh, factor come into uh, making the revolution? Um, and how can you say it's a bourgeois revolution if there was no bourgeoisie leading it? Well, uh, it, it to, to, it, partly in um, Hill's defense, um, the whole issue of the Atlantic merchants, I, I took that uh, uh, almost lock, stock, and barrel from um, Robert Brenner's book, Merchants and Revolution. That book did not come out until 1993. Um, 
there had been a long article in the journal Past and Present, which Hill was one of the founders of, uh, 20 years before. So some of the, at least some of the concepts were not unknown to him or shouldn't have been. Um, but he never picked up on it. Uh, as far as I know, he never reviewed Brenner's book. Um, I don't know if he ever read it. Um, and uh, in any case, um, there's only one, I, I was only ever able, I only ever came across one um, comment in passing about it, which again is in the preface of my book. Um, why the restoration? Um, well, um, history either goes forward or backward. And if you can't go forward, things start to slip backward. Um, I would point to um, the state of abortion rights in the United States today as a cautionary example. Um, that's the problem. You know, it's it's a flow and it's a process and it either goes forward or it stagnates and eventually you cannot stagnate for very long. Um, Cromwell, there are some particulars involved. Of course, Cromwell died in 58. Um, and, uh, you know, his, his son took over as the, uh, Richard took over as protector. Um, but Richard was not a military man. He had never been in the army. He had no relationship with any of the army officers. Um, some of whom were pretty radical, at least at one point or another. Um, and um, uh, he had no idea what he was doing. Um, and, you know, they got rid of him pretty quickly. He was simply a, you know, a rural gentleman and, and uh, uh, had, he, didn't, he didn't know much about politics. He had no sense for politics at all. Um, you can't, you know, no, no society can ever be uh, uh, better than its technical level. Um, you know, this again, this comes from Marx. Um, you can't, uh, the, the technical level of any society is fundamentally conditioned, uh, I'm sorry, co fundamentally conditions all other aspects, the political, the cultural, the ideological. Um, when, uh, if you cannot meet people's needs, whether it's because of bad harvests, which they suffered, um, and um, uh, if you don't have a, um, uh, a stable class society, uh, then things are going to get dicey. And the fact that you've had a revolution um, can change a great deal, of course, but you can't just say, okay, well, now the revolution's over. Um, other revolutions, otherwise revol they degenerate. And sooner or later, they go backward. Um, that's unfortunate, but it's a reality. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Very, very good, thank you, yes. Okay, excellent, thank you. So now we have um, Janet Corbin, Raj Sahai, and another person, who is listed as Dev Dahanova, I think. We'll put him on the uh, stack. And so next is Janet, uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this presentation. Uh, yeah, um, sustainability of advances has been a challenge for human beings. It seems like, uh, uh, it skips or these advances uh, skip generations or, you know, it's every other generation that then has to almost start from scratch. Anyway, um, so Gro Grover mentioned the enclosure movement, and I wanted to know if you would talk about how that fa factored into this revolution, assuming it did. Thank you. Sure. Um... Yeah, no, you're you're right about um, uh, 
human beings in, in, in generations in the sense that when there are defeats, it takes time for their, you know, when things go backward and so on, it does take a generation or so to, to before you can pick up the pieces. Um, and of course, it depends on a lot of specifics and how bad those defeats were. So, for example, the defeat, uh, the degeneration of the English Revolution um, at the uh, end of the 1650s um, led to the restoration of Charles II. But a uh, little over 28 years later, there's the revolution in 1688, um, which, uh, in which, by the way, all of this it was over all of the same issues. Uh, James II was was an open Catholic, and he believed, you know, um, uh, he he wanted to bring back his father Charles the uh, society. Um, well, that didn't go over very well with those uh, who were, you know, and how it had how things had evolved by that time. Um, but yes, it, so it took a while. Um, but these are these are the this is this is. Human beings are the participants, but it's also what happens to the social systems. Um, so the, uh, for example, the prerogative court, Star Chamber and, and uh, High Commission did not return under Charles II with the restoration. So there were, there were significant differences. Things did not simply go back to the way they were, which is also usually the way it goes. Um, but again, it depends on the specifics. Uh, enclosure. So, enclosure, which um, the uh, Tudors and Stuarts all opposed um, and called depopulation, um, began around roughly in the very late uh, 15th century. Um, Henry, Henry the first. Henry, the first King Henry Tudor, Henry VII, uh, took power in uh, 1585. Um, and um, what happened was, I'm sorry? 1485. 1485, sorry. thank you very much. Yes, quite right. Uh, 1485, thank you. Um, and in about that period, the price of wool, um, English wool, in the Low Countries, uh, Antwerp, uh, went up. I'm not sure why, but it did. Uh, became even more valuable. And even more nobles and gentry, large gentrymen, um, began to convert uh, arable land into uh, sheep raising. Um, and so they enclosed the lands to make uh, larger um, uh, estates um, and for greater efficiency. Um, this threw many of the peasants off the land. Uh, there was a great wave of it. Um, Henry VIII's government persecuted these people terribly, um, thousands of them, maybe tens of thousands. Um, and um, they were homeless, they were workless, there was no place for them to go. Um, uh, and enclosure continued to be an issue. Uh, the, the, by the way, the, the government was very concerned about this in part because um, you know, it could lead to insurrection, it could lead to uprisings. These were desperately poor people, um, had no way to support themselves. Um, and it also, uh, the conversion uh, from uh, uh, arable land, uh, meant that there it could lead potentially to food shortages. Um, so the Tudors and, and later the Stuarts were uh, all very concerned with this. There were uh, periodically there were laws passed through Parliament against it. Um, and uh, there were you know people uh, landowners could be fined. Um, and this went on episodically all the way to uh, 1640. Um, I found a quote in Capital, it's in my book about, um, you know, uh, how for 150 years, the, the law was futile, you know, laws against us were completely, you know, fought against it without any effect. 
Um, well, it slowed things down a bit, but it didn't, it wasn't very effective. These laws were not very effective. Um, and um, uh, there were, uh, and this is what, so this is what created, you know, and this continued all the way, by the way, enclosures continued, uh, as I said, epi somewhat episodically, but they continued all the way to the late 19th century. Um, by about the middle of the 19th century, uh, I'm sorry, by the middle of the, um, not the 19th century, the 18th century, uh, by about the middle of the 18th century, 1750, there are about um, most of the yeomen, the small landowners, the small holders, as they called them, uh, people who could only uh, 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 maintain themselves through subsistence agriculture, um, were gone. The entire class no longer, simply no longer existed. And what you had uh, were huge numbers of people tramping all over uh, England uh, on the roads, trying to find some place to fit in, um, which continued. I mean, this was this was an enormous social problem, um, and it continued until at least the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, when they were suddenly all sucked up into uh, the factories um, and the railroads and the mines. Um, so, um, yeah, the, uh, I somewhere there must be, I, I haven't seen one that I can remember, somewhere there must be a book that just talks about the entire uh, history and progress of enclosure in England. Um, it's uh, because it, it, it recurs over and over again, you know, over two to 300 years. Um, and um, it's, it's very interesting, but it's, it's absolutely, it, in that sense, it's absolutely perennial. But I mean, did you look in, into how that affected the revolution? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a chapter in my book called uh, The Revolution in the Countryside. Um, and one of the uh, big um, uh, complaints, grievances of the, of the peasantry uh, was enclosure, uh, particularly by Charles I, by the way. Um, and um, uh, in fact, in the very early 1630s, uh, he modified the forest law in a way to benefit himself uh, and started enclosing lands. Uh, and there was enormous resistance to this in the Western part of England in particular. Um, the, and it was the largest, um, um, you know, sort of social conflict uh, until the Civil War. Um, but yes, as, as with the revol following, even with the revolution in London, 41 to 42, um, there were riots, uh, there were anti-enclosure attacks, they, they broke the enclosures. Um, a lot of the, a lot of this was taking place in um, what were called the Fens areas, um, which were kind of, um, um, you know, watery areas, um, um, and um, uh, di where, where dikes had been built and dams and things like that, and these were torn down by peasants. There's a great deal of peasant class struggle, yes, going on uh, in that period, and I do, I do uh, uh, talk about it, you know, uh, to some degree in in that, particularly in that chapter. Okay, well, th thank you. And we'll move forward to, I have Raj and then Dev Hanova, I think. Uh, so Raj. Thank you very much, Michael. I, I wasn't aware of this part of history. I had assumed that it was a bourgeois revolution as most people have assumed, Marxist included. Uh, how how the poor, the working poor, played a role. Uh, thank you very much for uh, telling us about that. Uh, so I have a question. You know, industrial capitalism develops later on. Uh, it starts then, uh, not quite then, but it's in the starting more in the later part of 17, but mostly 18th century, right? It's a phenomenon of 18th century and 19th century where industrial capitalism develops in England. England is the most successful. So 
it seems like, uh, and you, you're, you applied Marxist methods very well, so I really appreciate it. So from that point, I wanted to know what are the factors that kept the English working class to do what was attempted in, unsuccessfully in Europe and then successfully in Russia? What are the factors that English working class, which definitely struggled starting as, as, as you book suggest in your talk suggest, in the middle of the 19th century, why, what are the factors that prevented them to also become the uh, first one to overthrow capitalism. What are what are those factors? Uh, well. <clears throat> um, yeah, well, <laughs> many books undoubtedly have been written about that. Um, first of all, I would say that industrial capitalism really belongs to the 19th century. Um, very late 18th century, you begin to have mechanization. Um, but but the steam engine doesn't really come into um, play until the very early 19th century. Um, 1806, I think, 1806 or something like that. Something like that, yeah, exactly. What you really had during most of the 18th century, yes, there was, of course, there were advances, there was progress in, in, in capitalism generally, but to a very great extent, uh, capital was commercial capital, trade. Um, and um, um, growing out of uh, you know what had had the the 17th century revolutions, um, this was um, uh, not terribly surprising. Um, but uh, commercial capital isn't really doesn't for the most part um, uh, contribute very much to production, right? It's it's trade be of um, uh, finished goods in the mother country being shipped out to colonies and raw materials coming back, et cetera. Um, and most of that capital ends up going back into, well, aside from what goes in, in as profits into the merchant's pockets, uh, goes back into more trade. Um, one of the things that, that differentiated the early Atlantic merchants from the older merchants was that, in fact, they would uh, get involved to a certain degree uh, in putting capital into plantations, whether it was tobacco or later sugar. Um, but again, this was uh, only to support the trade. To them, this was sort of a secondary uh, uh, attribute. Um, so, uh, and this persisted for a, a lot of the 18th century. So, um, that being said, um, why didn't why didn't um, uh, the English or actually now British proletariat uh, after the Union in 1707 <laughs> uh, uh, between England and Scotland uh, overthrow capitalism as we all might have liked to think they would have? Um, well, um, you know, in a certain sense, capitalism developed automatically in out of feudalism. Uh, things there was there was there were enough factors, particularly in England. Um, I go into this a little bit in the book, the beginning of the book, um, not least the fact that it was an island. Uh, that gave it a certain insularity and allowed it time for capitalist market relations to develop and spread. Um, and um, a socialist revolution, a proletarian revolution, on the other hand, has to be made consciously. There's nothing automatic about it. This is this is uh, the working class taking stepping stepping up, taking responsibility and that requires a leadership that can understands that necessity uh, as a program that it adheres to that can win authority amongst the working class um, these are these are all factors that um, uh, you know have to come together I'm not going to go into the whole history of England or or the left yeah. uh, but um, the short answer is, the uh, things didn't align uh, enough. Uh, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't that there weren't um, 
uh, attempts. Uh, one thinks of the 1926 general strike in England, uh, in Britain, uh, when the uh, miners, the dockers, and the uh, uh, truck drivers uh, were all on strike. Um, and uh, as my understanding is that the prime minister finally called in the heads of those unions and said, well, gentlemen, uh, you are in control of the country. Are you ready to assume power? And they all went, oh my God, no, <laughs> because they were not revolutionaries. They were trade unions. Yeah, um, that, but I, just if I persist, persist for a minute, actually I gave you two general, didn't mean to drag you into this big question, but, uh, specifically, I wanted to ask, suggest, was colonization where American colony uh, and working workers leaving England to come here, was that a factor contributing to slowing down of worker militancy in England? In, in the that, 17th century? Yeah. Uh, no. Or, or not some in, not in the 17th century, no. <clears throat> okay, because there were very few. There were very few at that point. There wasn't enough industry. There was no proletariat in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. People left Eng people left England for the New World uh, primarily for one of two reasons. One was religious freedom because they were being persecuted at home, um, and the other was because they want if they saw it as an opportunity to acquire land. And of course, land had always in England been the chief uh, attribute. If you had land, you had the possibility of, of making a living, of feeding yourself, of becoming somebody, possibly. Um, and so this was very attractive to a lot of people. And of course, uh, it was a lot harder in, in America, you know, probably harder than a lot of them realized, but many of them tried. Um, but it wasn't because they were. Um, uh, uh, working class or, or try, I mean, they were opposed to the king's government. Um, and it also went the other way at times. So once the Civil War uh, broke out, for example, students at Harvard University, which had been founded by that time, um, returned to England because they were radicals and they, en and they enrolled in, in Cromwell's army. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Next we have... Um... Dev Hanova, and if there's no one else on the list, I will put myself on the stack. So, Dev, go ahead. Well, hi, Michael. Um, thank you very much uh, for this excellent talk. This is the area I have been very much interested in for a while, and uh, um, because this is one illustration how the capitalist mode of production became dominant in England over the feudal mode of production and how this transition happened, you know, and the, and the period it took for, for that to happen. So, and I have two questions. One is, um, if you could say something about the two lines in the new model army of the parliaments, you know, the as expressed in two documents, what's the heads of proposals, which were by the officers, Cromwell and his officers, and the other one was agreement of the people. And I'm surprised to read about the how revolutionary that agreement of the people document was. And uh, uh, so, so the two lines in the army are going on. And uh, the other thing um, about the enclosure movement, it, I was just thinking if you, uh, what do you think? that 14th century plague, which devastated the English, uh, you know, European population and uh, and the countryside was devastated. And a lot of the farms, uh, they had no labor peasants there to work on and were converted by these landowners into sheep growing area, which led to the wool trade and rise of agriculture in the um, uh, rise of capitalist mode of production in the agriculture was, um in 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 15th century or so um can you elaborate on those two things um i'll try <laughs> uh just a little bit um so just about what you were saying just now yes it's absolutely true the the uh, mid 14th century uh, plagues uh 
created an enormous labor shortage in uh, in England, and many peasants were would not who were um, uh, obligated to provide labor service to their lords uh, refused to do so unless they who would pay them. Um, and so this this uh, heavily undermined feudal relations. Um, uh, it had already been going on for a while, actually, particularly for specialized work. Uh, peasants would often insist on being paid to do that, uh, but it became more general. Uh, and then you had the Peasants' Rebellion in um, 1381, and this was an enormous uprising. It didn't last terribly long, but its significance uh, was equal to that of the later Peasants' War in Germany. Um, uh, again, this I go over much of this in the book. Um, so uh, yes, and it it uh, again because England was an island, um, uh, it, it the um, uh, it provided time for for uh, capitalist market relations to uh, pro, uh, to make progress. Um, the um, uh, I'm sorry, what, what came out of, um, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, what came out of the uh, Peasants' Revolt of 1381 um, was a, uh, a new form of relationship between the peasants and, and the landowners. Um, and it was called copyhold. Um, it was a compromise, uh, but it, substantially freed the peasants from being bound to the land. They could move elsewhere uh, if they wanted to. They could um, sell any surplus they might be able to produce. Um, they were able to, they, they no longer had labor obligations to the Lord for the most part. They were given a written title to the land uh, and their descendants could inherit the farm upon payment of a large fine or fee. Uh, by custom, the rents were low. Um, so it didn't make them freeholders like the yeomen who were independent, but it did uh, uh, create what was essentially a bourgeois uh, contractual arrangement uh, as opposed to the old feudal arrangement. And this was a tremendous advance. Um, uh, that contributed to the growth of capitalism in England. That was the end of serfdom in England then. Yes, and, and as a result, it replaced, yes, it, it wasn't um, uh, all at once. Various mm -hmm. historians give various uh, estimates of how long it took, but certainly by the mid uh, 15th century, uh, 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 serfdom was, was gone. Uh, for all intents and purposes. It may have held out here and there in pockets and so on, but but copyhold became the normal uh, way of doing things. Um, and in part, uh, the fact that the nobles could now raise wool for export to the continent compensated them and probably made it easier uh, for them to agree to the peasants' demands. It gave them an alternative source of an income. Uh, also made them uh, participants in capitalist market relations, uh, right. which um, you know, um, uh, which is something that, for example, French nobility never did. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the big differences between the two countries. Um, the heads of proposal and the agreement of the people. So the levelers' um, uh, political program was this agreement of the people. And in fact, uh, their, uh, the way that they wanted to uh, raise um, uh, awareness of it was they actually want, and, and support for it, was they actually wanted to uh, you know, take it around the country and have people sign it. Um, the, um, uh, just looking for some notes here. Uh, uh, um, they influenced the already uh, radical, uh, pu radical, pu radically Puritan uh, ranks of the New Model Army. 
um, many of whom were not Puritans, actually, they were to the left of the Puritans, they were, sec they were sectarians, they were separatists uh, of various kinds. Um, I recommend uh, Christopher Hill's book, The World Turned Upside Down, about them. Um, but um, uh, after the first civil war, uh, which ended in uh, 45, uh, 45 to 46, um, the, uh, the army ranks demanded and the officer uh, Cromwell and Fairfax uh, agreed. Uh, the army met at a place called Putney in 47, um, not terribly far from London. Um, and they had a debate about the future, uh, what the future of England should be uh, and how it was going to look politically. <clears throat> um, there was sharp disagreement. Uh, most of the officers, uh, particularly Cromwell um, and his son-in-law, who uh, largely spoke for him um, at this thing, um, were much more conservative. Um, the uh, leveler, the people who spoke, many of the who from the ranks, many of them had been um, influenced by the levelers. Uh, many of them were called. Many of them had been elected by the ranks, uh, and they were called agitators or agents. Um, and um, there was sharp disagreement about this. Um, uh, they wanted um, a very extensive uh, voting uh, franchise. Um, and Cromwell was only for uh, property owners having the franchise. Um, because if you didn't have, because if, if anyone, if a landless person could vote, then they could take over the House of Commons uh, and abolish uh, landed property. What was to prevent them? This was virtually communism. Um, and he baited them as communists, um, which they weren't. Um, but um, the, um, so as a compromise, uh, the officers put forward this thing called heads of the proposals. I can't go, I don't have anything at my fingertips about what the differences were. I have read about it some time ago. It was a more moderate document. Uh, it did not go anywhere near as far as the agreement of the people um, that Lilburn and Richard Overton, the leveler leaders, tried to negotiate with Cromwell. Um, and um, even when the officers, when things were, were had, had come to a, um, a head again uh, in 48, 49, um, the, um, they thought they had an agreement uh, on a revised agreement of the people uh, and Cromwell double crossed them. Uh, instead, they, you know, their idea was that we should take it around the countryside and get people to sign it and pump for it. Um, Cromwell simply gave it to the House of Commons where it died in committee. Um, so it never went anywhere. Uh, that's, that's the most I can tell you at the moment. Um, the, uh, it, it was simply a, a much more watered down document that the officers were reluctantly uh, willing to perhaps go along with. But it, it also, I mean, they, they weren't going to implement it without, you know, unless they were forced to. Yeah. I mean, it just illustrates the class differences there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, again, you know, Cromwell, <laughs> Cromwell was a member of the gentry. He was a very, he was, a, he was more radical than many of them. Um, and he was determined to militarily defeat the king uh, because he understood that this was the only way you could get reform of religion, that the Church of England was ever going to be able to uh, be revived in, in any kind of form that he could possibly accept. Um, and he wasn't alone in, in that feeling. Um, of course, even after the Civil War, even after the Second Civil War, uh, the King was still trying to negotiate with, with various factions in Parliament. Uh, and um, uh, it was simply, you know, it was completely hopeless. Uh, you know, what, what, uh, where Cromwell always thought that it would force the king to sign an agreement, the king had no intention of doing so. Um, and so they finally put him on trial at the demand, as, as a way of, a, of, a, of appeasing the ranks, the army ranks, 
who were demanding justice for the king. Um, they put him on trial and he was executed in January of 49. Okay, well, well, thank you so much and we're approaching our end, but I do have one last question that I would like to ask uh, because I was really struck by, by your discussion here of these, uh, you know, what we, now these extremists, I mean, these people in contemporary terms, we would call them violent extremists and we'd lock them up, I think. Uh, and I just think about, you know, the January 6th insurrection. And, you know, I think of the images. Sometimes I, you know, watch mm -hmm. the storm, the Congress, and I think back about Eisenstein's pictures of uh, the Russian Revolution storing, storming the uh, Winter Winter Palace. So uh, maybe you could bring that, bring your discussion up to that, to the present, and and what's going on now. But the other thing that struck me is that the means of communication. Uh, right now, we know what's happening. You know, within a few hours, anywhere in the world. But back then, uh, they they didn't. How did they communicate? Because they had uh, they didn't ha they didn't have email. Uh, so how, I mean, all my information comes to the internet. So uh, it's a much different situation. So if you could just comment on that and then move forward to your um, final comments. And after you finish, we're uh, almost at our mandatory when you stop the recording. So um, comment um, on my co that yeah, observation yeah. and then Make your your own final comments, and we'll we'll stop the recording. Okay, uh, so I don't want to say very much about January six, except that I don't think it's a bad thing that people don't trust the government. Um, the problem, of course, is what they what they believe is a reasonable alternative. Um, so um, that's one thing. Uh, I'm sorry, the other question you had was about. Um, uh, you said January 6th, and we used something that communication, followed. communication, oh, communication. Means of communication. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah, that's actually quite interesting. So, um, that's quite true. Um, happily, they had pr uh, printing presses, um, they were small, they were they were they were um, uh, portable, there weren't many, but they did exist, uh, some of them in secret. Um, and uh, there were these what were called news books. Um, that were put out. They were early forms of newspapers. Um, and um, uh, they uh, people would come in from the countryside, couriers would come in from the countryside and pick up a bunch and take them back to their localities, um, both in London, um, uh, usually from often from pubs, um, and either in the pubs in London or in pubs in the countryside or some other place. Uh, people would read them out because a lot of people, of course, couldn't read. The majority of people couldn't read, um, but um, but a good number could. And uh, so someone who could read would would read them out. And this is how people stayed informed. But of course, yes, you're absolutely right. There was an enormous lag, uh, time lag in, in communication. It wasn't anything like today. It wasn't, it wasn't even anything like, wasn't even anything like, you know, when we were kids, for example, you know, in the 60s or 70s. Um, so, um, yeah, people, people got their news letters to some degree, uh, uh, passed on news. Uh, people who traveled for, for any reason uh, brought news of whatever they, they had seen um, or heard. Um, and, and that was it. Um, you you had to um, you could get around, um, but you couldn't. Um, uh, but you had to you had to wait for for somebody to bring you something either orally or or written to to know what was actually happening. Yeah, quite true. Okay, so so do you have any final comments uh, in general? But it's, it's been very fascinating, and uh, we are going to close in just a few minutes, but. Uh, yeah. I would just make the point that um, uh, you know that in any revolution, in any uh, any kind of of social movement that uh, requires uh, or that seeks uh, substantial 
uh, social change. Uh, it's going to be masses of people that make that change. Um, now, that begs the question of leadership, of political program, uh, of the concrete uh, uh, circumstances that exist in any given society at, at the time, uh, the level of culture, the level of industrialization. Um, uh, all of these things have to be looked at. And so when we study history, when we study revolutions, when we study, we are always looking at the social classes that are involved uh, at the um, uh, the issues that are moving people that they find um, intolerable, because that's that's really what what happens, right? When something people become radicalized, situations become polarized. When something that is simply uh, perceived as being an intolerable situation uh, goes goes is happening. Um, and its success or failure is always an open question. It depends on the relationship of forces and that, at, at that particular time. Um, and um, this, fundamentally, this is what Lenin was writing about. Read Lenin. Absolutely, and with those words, uh, we'll ask uh, Raj to stop the recording, but remember that we will keep the Zoom room open for another. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Propter Monsters Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S U N D A Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225. Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609 or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org. Don't move.